And welcome back, everybody. Another edition here of the Auburn Undercover Podcast on the 24-7 Sports Network. My name is Nathan King. Joining you live from the hotel room here in uh, Spokane, Washington. We have touched down. But we are ready for some Auburn basketball coverage, and we are super excited for that. Um, and to talk about Auburn's draw here in the NCAA tournament and the region overall, what to expect from Auburn's potential path back to the Final Four is Isaac Trotter, National College Basketball Writer for 24-7 Sports. We had Isaac on, um, I guess about a month ago now, kind of in the meat of SEC play. Um, and the response to that episode was great. You guys seemed like you really, really liked it. So we wanted to bring Isaac back on and uh, give us his wealth of basketball knowledge. So I guess, Isaac, uh, you know, welcome back to the show and appreciate you having Appreciate you coming on here, and uh, I guess what is your excitement level like as we uh, as we get set? I guess tomorrow, as we record this here on Wednesday, will be the first uh, first tournament games of March. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's it's fun to be back, and yeah, I mean, this is the best time, right? It's like that last little bit. I've looked at my bracket a hundred times. I I do like that first day on Sunday where I get like my first like bracket in my hand and like crank it out really quick, like first gut instinct. And I have like Auburn and UConn in the Sweet 16. I'm like, man, how's this going to go or whatever? Now by Thursday, I'm like convinced that Auburn's making a deeper run. It's just like it's just going to be weird for the next couple of days where I'm going back and forth on on how my uh, how my bracket's going to shake out. But I'm going to basically print out one last bracket in like an hour, fill it all out and go from there. That'll be my final bracket and we'll see how it turns out. I was going to say, at least for me, like I always... I'll make a bunch of them, and then whatever my gut instinct was, that always proves to be the best one. Like the first bracket I fill out always ends up being the best one. Um, and that's something, too, when we're bringing Isaac on for you guys. Um, you know, this is obviously going to be talking a lot about Auburn, being talk, talk a lot about what their path looks like. Um, but if you're filling out a bracket as well here on the – if you're listening to this on Thursday morning, hopefully we can give you guys some good advice, at least for the East region. Be a whole other show. There's lots of shows out there that will preview the entire thing. We're going to focus on Auburn here. Um so I guess we'll get into it here. Um, just sort of talking about Auburn. I guess what was your what was your reaction to them? You know, Spokane is one thing. That's whatever. The pod system is not doing what it's intended to do, but that's fine. What was your reaction, I guess, to them getting a four seed? Because a lot of people, obviously, in Auburn thought it should have been higher. They make that great run. Um, at the end of the day, they only have three quad one wins on the season. Um, but I guess just what was your reaction to to their seeding and any other surprises that you that you may have seen once the bracket was revealed? Yeah, I didn't think that the seating committee did a very good job, to be honest, with just this bracket. You know, I, I don't want to debate the last four in, first four outs thing. Like, the, you're kind of picking straws with with all of the last, you know, the the automatic bids that got stolen throughout the sport, especially with Oregon coming in, NC State coming in, uh, two bids in the AAC, two bids in the A10. But I thought that the seating is just egregious for some of these things. And Auburn certainly has a case to be a little bit higher. Um, also, the placement of where they are as the worst four seed with the best number one seed was weird as well for me, too. So it's just it's just weird. So I felt like they didn't necessarily weigh the predictive metrics as much. And so now we have a region where UConn's a number one seed and they get the number four team on Ken Palm. They get Iowa State in here, who's phenomenal, best defense in, in college basketball. And they get Illinois in this region, who has the number one offense since January 1st. And I, I just wish that the committee had stepped back, looked at this East region and goes, you know what? We probably have way too many really good teams in here. Can we balance this one out a little bit? Because it feels a little bit unfair that only one of these teams is going to get to go to the Final Four. Yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, four four top ten Ken Palm teams. Um, you really just look at the the way they finish the season, too. I mean, all four of those teams win their uh, win their conference tournament. I mean – all four of those teams are feeling really good about themselves. And we, we talked about it the night of selection Sunday on our podcast. Like there's two sides of the same coin. And, and I definitely get the Auburn being, you know, a little bit upset with you do all that. And what's your reward? Not only, not only the number one overall seed, but if you make it there, you are going to be playing them in Boston, which is, I mean, Hey, it's, it's good living to be the number one overall seed, right? Like in terms of where you get to play, that's how it is every year. It's, it's great to be in that position. Um, in terms of locations. But if you're UConn, you're also in a position where you're like, thanks a lot. You know, you you have to beat potentially, you know, you got to beat Auburn, you know, Iowa State and and in Illinois, like you mentioned, those are those are three teams that are playing better than most in college basketball right now. I mean, you do like the the Torvik projections here where you can set the dates. I mean, if you set since March 1st, these four teams, maybe four of the best six or seven teams in all of college basketball and the 
somebody's got to come out of this region. You know, UConn is obviously not invincible here, but I do think there's two sides of that coin. Like UConn is the giant that you got to take take down. But also if you're UConn, you're thinking, man, if, if they're going to go back and try to defend as national champions, they're, they're going to have to earn it here probably two or three times. No question. And I think draw matters more than ever before. You know, we saw it, especially when Kansas went on that run to win the national title a couple of years ago. That region, the moment it went in there, it was like, OK, we have a really fraudulent four seed in Providence, a really fraudulent two seed in Auburn that a lot of people were like iffy on that team that wouldn't get Jabari Smith the ball enough. And then the three seed was Wisconsin in that region. And everyone's like, well, that we don't like that team. Right. It's the Johnny Davis show. And what do you know? It's just, that region opens wide up. And there goes Kansas all the way to the national championship game. The draw matters. And so, you know, if you're an Auburn fan and you're irritated about the draw, I get it. If you're a UConn fan, you're irritated about the draw, I get it. You can make the same case for Iowa State and Illinois as well. But again, I think the point that you made is the best one of like, these teams all feel great about where they're at right now. Someone's going to get punched in the mouth this first weekend. And I'm fascinated to see how quickly that switches from like, okay, like we're playing good. We've been really rolling oh my God, we're down by seven at the under 16 timeout in the second half. Like, how do we get this back on track to get our season on the line? I, I'm fascinated by it because it can't, it, like what you've done before does not matter with 60 minutes to go in the in the round of 32. It just doesn't. Yeah, and I mean, teams, you see that all the time. I mean, you, you can beckon back even to the last time Auburn made a Final Four run, um, should have lost to New Mexico State. Not just they were on the ropes, absolutely should have lost um, that game, they blew it in the final minute. You never would have known that team was about to go on a run where they beat, you know, three straight blue bloods, beat them pretty handily. Um, so you just, you're right. That first game, you know, Bruce Pearl was saying it this week, he's like the hardest, the hardest one to win is always going to be the first one. Um, he also brought up a good point of, um, it seems like the, the officiating. And that was something that Auburn fans really had to get used to because the SEC this year, SEC officiating has a bad connotation to it. Um, it, it's been pretty bad. And it just inconsistent is probably the best word. And I, you, we saw it with our own eyes. These teams got to Bridgestone. They got to Nashville. And they were, like, surprised when they'd go up for a shot, defend it really physically, and they didn't call anything. And so, you know, Bruce Pearl says, you know, even, even minute things like that, as the tournament goes on, he's like, look, the second weekend, they're going to call even less stuff. Final Four, they're going to call even less stuff. And so, you know, adjusting to that, that first game in a new environment, in a new location, new officiating, everybody's going to be kind of filling that out. Um, a little bit. I guess we'll start with with Auburn's game there um, and their opportunity to move to five and zero in in first round NCAA tournament games under Bruce Pearl. Their opponent is Yale, who is an awesome March story because they get in on a on a bunny in the uh, in the Ivy League uh, tournament championship game. Um, you know, it, it, James Jones has done a, has done a great job as the as the coach there. But I guess as you sort of scouted this this bracket and took a look at Yale, I think they are very cookie cutter. Uh, Ivy League team in terms of what they do, um, but they have the potential to, to shoot really well and they're very fundamentally sound. Um, I think Auburn is in a position where athletically and physically definitely have an advantage depth wise. They run a seven man rotation. You got an advantage there. Um, but, you know, what are some things that if you were Auburn, you'd be looking out for and saying, hey, we can't get we can't let Yale do their do this or else it might be a, might end up being a pretty close game. Well, you know, the thing is, I think the, the Ivy's been better than a lot of people think over the years. I think the athleticism and the type of dudes that they're getting are a lot better than what it has been in the past. And this Yale team is no joke. Danny Wolf is a beast. Uh, the, the ability to play against really good teams early in the preseason or in the non-conference, I think, has given them a lot of, you know, they feel pretty comfortable going up against Auburn because like, hey, we've seen we've been in some really tough environments this year. We played Gonzaga. We've played Kansas. Like, we'll be ready for that. But I, I don't know. Like, Danny Wolf is a guy that there's a lot of portal buzz around him as like he's going to potentially be a pretty big name if he entered the portal and have a lot of buzz there where he could be a, a high major guy. And I see it. But I think that this is a bad matchup for Yale in a lot of different ways. Like this feels like a good spot for Auburn to kind of impose its will a lot. You know, you know, you see some of the guys that they bring in off the bench. Like I think every time I, I'm playing Auburn, I think about like, well, how do you guard Jalen Williams? Because you can guard, you can send multiple guys at Janai Broom, but Jalen Williams is the real one that can just basically just overwhelm smaller, weaker defenders. And does Nick Townsend get that assignment? He's like 6'7", 220. Like, are they going to play some of their athletic guards on that? Like, do they try to go four guards and shoot threes? Like, it's just, it feels like they don't have a really good guy to match up with Jalen Williams. And that's, that's an advantage for Auburn. So I think that 
I think that Yale is solid and good and certainly scary, but I just, I think I would have been on Yale as an upset pick if it was any other four seed than the number four team on Ken Palm, who is the deepest team in college basketball, who has loads of athleticism and size. So this just, it, Yale's a good team. This is a horrible matchup for them against Auburn. And if Auburn plays its game and does what it needs to do, I have them moving on. I mean, if you're looking for a comp, I, I asked Bruce Pearl about it this week, and I think he didn't didn't necessarily want to go there. Um, you know, but if if you're looking for an SEC comp, I at least see a little bit of South Carolina um, in this in this Yale team. They don't they play good sound defense. They don't force turnovers though. They don't want to get out and run. Their defensive rebounding rate is through the roof, but that's because they all just gang rebound. They ain't trying to get out and run. They're trying to get a board, get set, and then run their stuff. And uh, not to just play apples to apples, and it's not that simple, but you know, Auburn annihilated South Carolina in, in two meetings this year. And so um, I tend to agree with you. I think I think Auburn's game plan is going to be, look, you know, don't gamble. Don't don't try to do things out of our normal defensive stuff because, um, you know, and upsets happen. Look, this is um, Mahoney, I believe, August August Mahoney for, for Yale. Bruce Pearl brought up over his last like six or seven games, and he's like 60% from three. I mean, they have dudes who can do it. I think the key for Auburn is, hey, don't put yourself in a position where you're going to let them do it. Just go in there and be physical and play your type of defense. Yeah, and just know the scouting report. Just got to be locked in on the scouting report. Bez Embang, their 6'4 guard, isn't a great shooter, right? Like, understand what Danny Wolf does well. I like Danny Wolf defensively maybe more than I like him offensively. So, like, how do we use Janai Broom as, like, a decoy to potentially – get him away from the rim because Wolf can really block shots, but he, you know, especially in pick and rolls, he's, his hands are great in ball screens. Like he got a, a lot of deflections. I was watching through some of the tape there. Like he can really get his hands on passes. He gets in the way. He's a legit 250. He like, he is a sec caliber big man, right? Like he's seven foot 250. This is not some small dude. And he's really cerebral defensively. So just understanding the scouting report, maybe you use Jalen Williams as a screener more. Maybe you're trying to just use Janai broom in, in that dunker spot to get Danny Wolf out of the actions a little bit where he can get his hands in there and create um, spots for them in transition but yeah understanding the shouting scouting report knowing who the shooters are keying in on those guys and i think you're probably okay because wolf is a great player but sometimes his back to the basket game isn't his strength like i don't think he's going to be able to go iso against Janai broom or dylan cardwell or whoever he plays up against in specific matchups if they get cross matched and really eat he's a great big man in the in the ivy but going one-on-one -on -one against sec caliber athletes is a little different story yeah, let's let's stay in Spokane here and just kind of bounce um, quickly to San Diego State and UAB. That would be, of course, Auburn's potential round of 32 opponent. Um, I think a lot of people in the state of Alabama would like to see, um, you know, Auburn against UAB. It'd be a really cool story. Bruce against Andy Kennedy. They have a really great relationship. They've actually private scrimmaged against UAB a couple times since Kennedy got there, um, just because of how much they like each other, how easy it is to kind of to kind of do that. But, um, you know, the Blazers ended up being a bit of a surprise team to, to make the tournament here. Um, they've done a good job under Kennedy. And of course, San Diego State, we now know, you know over, over the years, they've just developed that kind of rapport. Of course, they're coming off that great run last year. Any chance you give you give the Blazers, I guess, you know, 512 is one that you can sometimes go that way. How can how can they maybe pull that one off and maybe meet up with Auburn in the round of 32? Yeah, I, I'm really close to picking UAB to win this game. Uh, part of the reason why is San Diego State is just can't shoot anymore. They like the the threes for San Diego State have not fallen in a while. The last time I checked, I think they're like 27 percent from three in since February first. Like that's that's a real problem. It feels like it's hey, it's Jaden Ladee time. And when we don't have Jaden Ladee and the jumpers aren't falling, what are we doing if we're not turning someone over and getting out in transition? So that's a real interesting matchup too because UAB is great on the glass. Uh, Yaxel Lindenborg is awesome out there. Christian Coleman will come in and mess around on the glass at a, at a high level. JV and Davis is another one who can really rebound as well. So they're not going to be intimidated by San Diego State at all. Now, the Mountain West in the NCAA tournament has had a pretty checkered past. So if you're looking to potentially you know, be on a Mountain West team, it's a little scary when you see all their records like, oh, San Diego State's run last year is the major outlier from it. And this San Diego State team – I understand that they have a lot of familiar faces, but they I don't think they're quite as good as what they were last year. Like the, you're going to look on Ken Palm and it's like, oh, top 10 defense. But I'm not sure that's quite as good as it is. Sometimes I think numbers lie to us a little bit. And that's the vibe I keep getting with them is that their ball pressure is good. 
but you can get them at the rim a little bit more than what they had in the past. Last year, Nathan Mensah was one of the best rim protectors in college basketball and was a big reason why they went on that deep run. They don't have that elite true rim presence defensively. And I think that's a really big subplot with this group. And I think if UAB can just make enough jumpers to stick around, they can certainly do it because Eric Gaines is really talented, obviously played in in the SEC for a while before transferring down there. And he's had a great year. And Alejandro Vasquez has stepped up a little bit at times, too. So I'm close to picking UAB. We'll see if we get it, though. Yeah, so just quickly before before we go away here um, to another part of the of the East region who do you sort of I, I think you know Auburn is I think Auburn's the best team in Spokane I mean that's that's not it's not you know a, a big upset to say that um better better chance of upsetting Auburn in the round of 32 UAB or San Diego State I would go San Diego State has the better chance of beating them uh just because that th- those guards for them are older and veterans and then if you're looking at Auburn like what's the one maybe hiccup with them it's like hey do we really trust our young guards to make good decisions so like with San Diego State, it's like, okay, we have Darian Trammell. He's been there, done that. He's an old veteran guard. Lamont Butler obviously hit the game winner against FAU last year in the Final Four. Been there and done that. Micah Parrish is an old guard. Reese Dixon Waters. Uh, I think he's going by Reese Waters now uh, out of uh, USC. He's an old veteran guard. He's been around the block a little bit. So San Diego State definitely is built more to handle Auburn's pressure. They're definitely built more to handle the the tenacity that Auburn play, plays with. But and, and those veteran guards are, I think, a real, real, you know, if you're if you're trying to pick holes in Auburn, it's the young guards making mistakes against a really great pressure defense with a bunch of vets. And that's what San Diego State is. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with you. It's 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 not that Auburn doesn't have a weakness. It's just that it's difficult to find something they are necessarily very bad at because it feels like their floor is just kind of pretty high. Um, but if you were to, I mean, defensively, that's one thing um, that. I don't think you have any question marks with not many with these guards right now. I mean, Trey Donaldson and what Trey Donaldson and Denver Jones did in terms of defending and even Chris Moore and Chaney Johnson. I mean, in that Florida game, it was like those dudes had never seen a guy switch on the perimeter before. I mean, they had them absolutely locked up. Um, Aiden Holloway has become a good defender for his size, but you're right. It is, you know, can Aiden Holloway go get you a bucket when he needs to, you know, Trey Donaldson has had some inconsistencies, but he's really good. He's been good in March his past uh, his past couple seasons. And so, um, you know, I, I don't – obviously most people would have Auburn moving on to the Sweet 16. Um, you'd have a couple more, you know, elements there that would be interesting against San Diego State. Of course, you have Chad Baker-Mazzara going against his uh, going against his former team where that wasn't even a team. If they if they do end up playing them, I'll be really interested to talk to him about that here because um, as best we understand it, like that was a – they had a good relationship. I mean, he was Mount West sixth man of the year. Um, he still has a good relationship with those teammates. It's just academic stuff. I mean, it was in his hands why that why that didn't um, work out. Obviously, he was a good player there. And so um, we'll see what happens there. But on the other side of it, as we sort of kind of feels like, and of course, we all feel this way, so it's not going to end up this way because that's how March Madness works. But it feels like Auburn and UConn are on this collision course in the, uh, in the Sweet 16. Is there, of course, there's a chance. Of course, there's a chance. But um, you know, whether it's Let's not. I don't think Stetson. We need to spend much time on the 16 seed there. But FAU or Northwestern against UConn in the second round. Do either of those teams, you know, make you feel anything about about the matchup with the Huskies? Yeah, I mean, okay. One, my one thing with Stetson. I don't know if people know this. They're the Hatters, right? At every home game, they all wear unique hats to those home games. It's the weirdest thing of all time. I kind of love it though. So it's cool. Like that. Yeah, it's very. It's a very niche thing. That's very college basketball at its best at the low major ranks. Anyway. Uh, FAU is can't guard this year, which is really weird to me. That doesn't seem like a great matchup against UConn. Um, Northwestern really injured and beat up right now. So that also is a, a thing that holds me back. Now, the one thing that Northwestern and FAU both have are those elite type of lead guards that can get into the middle of the lane and make shots against literally anybody. And, you know, Boo Booey from Northwestern's a complete bucket. And they run great actions there. They have a lot of shooting, which you need against UConn. You probably need to hit 10, 11, 12 threes if you're them. Uh, and the same thing with FAU with uh, Janelle Davis, who's a phenomenal, phenomenal player. And they can really score. And Vlad Golden, I think, is one of the most underappreciated big men in college basketball this year. Their net rating with him on the floor is just through the roof. When he sits, they – like he they, when he's on the floor, they're a really, really good team. And when he sits, they're an atrocious team. And if he got into foul trouble against Donovan Klingon and that UConn front line – it could get ugly in a hurry, but if he's able to stay on the floor, I think 
that could potentially create some matchups. So, I, I mean, UConn is definitely not going to be happy about playing that because Bowie is an All-American and FAU has been in the Final Four. Like, that's not that fun for a second-round game for the number one overall seed. So it's not going to be a, a rollover thing, but I think UConn just has too much and should advance. Quickly here through the other side of the of the East region, uh, you got six seed BYU against Duquesne. Um, we mentioned the three seed Illinois. Morehead State is kind of one that's a little tricky. Uh, looking at looking at what they present as a potential upset, uh, Washington State, at least from the outside looking in, you, you study these teams all year long a lot better than than I do. But it feels like they maybe ended up underachieving in terms of a seed because I think they played better than that most of the season. They played Drake um, and then Iowa State, who. Um, not many teams feeling better. I mean, when you just beat the tar out of Houston, you're you're going to be feeling pretty good going into the tournament there. Um, I guess, you know, what are the scenarios that you sort of see that would um, potentially prevent, you know, Illinois and, and Iowa State emerging from those uh, from those respective spots? Well, let, let's start. Let's start at the bottom. So Iowa State, uh, they, they're going to Omaha. Well, why does that matter? Drake is two hours away from Omaha. So like that's going to be a great crowd there. Washington State has to travel to, to Omaha to play a Drake team like that's going to have a huge home court advantage, basically. So I, I kind of like Drake in that spot. They have, they have the best player on the floor. Tucker DeVries is awesome, I think. So he's and, and that that coach there, Darian DeVries, is a rising superstar who's going to probably get a high major job this year, whether that's with Oklahoma State, maybe Michigan. He's he's going to be a high major coach very, very soon. And that's a great defense, too, that they have. So I like the the size that they have to combat Washington State, who really only has one good guard, Miles Rice, who beat cancer. So he's a great story. Um, but I, I just they really only have one great guard and a lot of their stuff is at the rim offensively. And that's where Drake's defense is, is really, really good. So I have Drake over Washington State. I think Iowa State will take care of South Dakota State, even though that's a, a good South Dakota State team coached by a really good coach. And then in that other spot, you know, it's it's BYU is the weirdest team in college basketball this year because they just shoot a billion threes like that. It's just if we make our threes, we win. And if we don't make our threes, we lose. And it's pretty much as simple as that. Like they're undefeated when they shoot 35 percent or, or higher from three and they lose all, all their games that they've lost is when they shoot under 35 percent from three. Wow. Uh, it's just that's just how it is. That's just how it is with them. Like they are the high variance team. And why is that like? That's scary in March because they could like, – everyone says, oh, you can beat anybody and you could lose to anybody. BYU could literally beat anybody or lose to anybody because that's just how their shot profile is. So if you can run on BYU, if you can really pound it in on the at, at the rim, that's going to be the advantage against them because their rim defense just isn't very, very good. Illinois is phenomenal at getting to the rim. They have one of the highest rim rates in all of college basketball. Terrence Shannon can get to the rim. Marcus Damas gets to the rim. Ty Rogers, they're big, they're physical. Every one of their guard, um, their starting lineup is over six foot six. So I, I, th I think I'm going to go pretty chalky. BYU take care of Duquesne. Illinois takes care of Moorhead State. Illinois over BYU. And then Iowa State over Washington State. and Or over Drake, excuse me. And, you know, I think the bubble is a little watered down this year just because of the bid thieves and so i think we might see more chalk and especially in a region like the east with so many great teams i'm leaning chalk here because i think that the best four teams here are like the best four with like a little bit of margin from the rest well there you go i mean there's a there's an upset pick um for you guys as you're filling out maybe still filling out some brackets um so you think drake is a i mean it sounds like a pretty good matchup there against against washington state I do. Yeah, I, I think Drake wins that game. Well, there you go. I mean, that 7-10 is usually, is usually decently competitive. Yeah, BYU, they're, they're also interesting because, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it's like they can't play on Sundays. And correct. so they had to do like the weird scheduling thing. Because, I mean, would they have been a higher seed than six or did that not affect that? I think they would have been a five. And so I think they moved them to six to do it. And so Duquesne would have been a 12. Has no business yep. being an 11, but I think they're an only 11 because they're playing BYU, and so it, they don't have to play on Sundays. It's weird, man. Like, it's just weird. If you haven't watched BYU this year, though, you're going to really like their Egyptian center, Ali Khalifa, transfer out of Charlotte. He's rollier polier. He doesn't necessarily look like a hooper. He has unbelievable passing. Just a complete wizard with the ball in his hands. Can really shoot it from three, too. He'll he'll do really cool bounce passes for backdoor cuts. He had a streak this year with like 35 assists and zero turnovers during one stretch. Like he's just, he's a delight. And so he's going to be a really, really fun watch. That BYU team, while they might drive you nuts because of how many threes they take, it is entertaining. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I always have, will have a soft spot for any BYU in March. I remember my seventh grade math teacher wheeling in the TV and we watched Jimmer Fredette. I think they played Florida when he just absolutely rained in the second half. I want to say my memory is serving me there. Um, that's what they're so going to do this year. That's what they're going to do this year. It's all threes, baby, all threes. Well, they're carrying on his legacy. I, th- I think in, in my uh, in one of my bracket groups, like a, we're just doing like a pool sort of thing. Um, I took Duquesne as like one of my teams only because I just like hot teams in March. And I look here eight straight for them, including running through their conference title. I think is it first that's I Duquesne is one of those teams where it's like, okay, I don't know much about them, but the name kind of pops up. I saw in the ticker today, first tournament since 1977. Yes. Yes. That's and their, coach, their coach is retiring too at the end of the year. So it's kind of like wow. the retirement revenge tour here. There's a lot of narratives a lot of narratives. Now, here's the other thing, too, with them. They really love to slow it down. They love to play great defense. Uh, so if you're trying to slow down BYU, it's like, all right, so if you're going to take all these threes in a low possession game, you better hope that they're all going in because there's your margin for error is a little bit thin. Now, the one problem with Duquesne is they might have the worst shot selection in all of college basketball, even worse than Katie Johnson, which is saying something at times. Like, they take horrible shots, just horrible. It's like it's a modern day miracle when they run a half court set that it something good happens on in offense. So that's my one pushback with Duquesne. It is ugly at times. Oh, they sound like just they sound you've named so many things that make me that have made me fall in love with that team. Uh they sound chaotic and maybe a little bit out of place and kind of all over the place with the coaches. Yeah, it's beautiful. Oh, absolutely. Well, and for every for every Katie Johnson, um, three on one or excuse me, one on three fast break that he takes all by himself. He'll make a corner three to put you up by nine in the second half. So it's like they, they, he had that technical foul where I thought, I thought Steven Pearl was going to personally march him out of the arena. Um, And then in the next game, he makes a bunch of really good plays. So you know what? You take it. You take the good with the bad. He's it he's like quintessential like, sixth man in college basketball. He's great. And the thing is, it's so funny is that like he's like basically is the one on one replacement. I have to check the I have to check the numbers on that. But he feels like the one on one replacement for Denver Jones, who feels like he's never rattled by literally anything. It feels like they're the most polar opposite players when they walk in. And Jones has been really good, by the way, lately. Who I that's a big subplot with Auburn. Why I'm lot more bullish on them than the, before just how his emergence late in the year but it's just the weirdest dichotomy because jones is super chill and then he subs out and here comes katie johnson who is a spaz in the best way possible i mean i think that's and not to go back to auburn too much but well i mean y'all listening don't don't mind i guess but i mean the the five you know going five for five when you have a true 10 man and it was 11 before before Lero berman's injury um but when you go five for five they all they're all different. And I think that is what and we talked about this in the last time we did the show, but like that second bench group and really now the starters are I haven't looked at the numbers, but at the beginning of the year it was like starters were they're figuring it out. And then the bench would just come punch you in the jaw and and you'd be down by 15 at halftime. Now and it's really been since they inserted Baker Mazzara into the into the starting lineup and Aiden Holloway came back in and is is playing a little bit better. Um the starters give you that punch and then the bench just kind of keeps it up but I mean that's a that is a good point by you it's like every single position really one through five because like Aiden Holloway is not going to get downhill the way Trey Donaldson does you mentioned the difference at two guard uh Baker Mazzara and Chris Moore are like complete opposite ends of spectrum players Dylan Cardwell and Janai Broom are good centers and both in their own right but like I mean Dylan Cardwell is nothing like what Janai Broom brings to the table I think probably the closest one is Chaney Johnson and Jalen Williams and they're still pretty different um yeah I mean you talk about Denver Jones it's like his last 10 games, he's like 51% from three. That so you, you mentioned the consistency too. It's like we were looking the other day. There are two pictures that Auburn Athletics had um, that are in the system. They're both of Denver Jones shooting a three-pointer from the corner. You you could Photoshop him out. It is the exact same form. Like he is one of the smoothest dudes they've had in a few years. And that's saying something. You know, they've had good shooting guards, but you're right. He just seems like he – and I asked him about it. I was like – Hey man, like teams are kind of checking up on you more and you're getting more blow by opportunities. Like, is that something you've noticed and you're kind of making an effort on? He was like, uh, not really. I kind of just, I kind of just get the ball and then whatever I see, I do. Like he very, very smooth offensive player. Um, which hey, we shouldn't be surprised about after he scored 20 points a game, but I'm with you. He is in his defense as well. I mean, it's it's disgusting. Very, very disgusting the way he defends on the perimeter. In my opinion, he is the best defender on this team. Um, maybe Janai Broom might be pretty close to him. 
I think I agree with you on that. Definitely the best perimeter defender on the team. The other thing, yeah. too, with him, I love that he's not just shooting threes. He's coming off the pin downs and getting real comfortable in the middle lane. Now, I missed a couple against Florida that were a little bit weird. I, I had some great looks. But he is really able to get downhill a lot better than what he was early in the year. I just feel like he just looks – just looks at ease. Just really like just I love the decision making from him. It's like if I'm open, I'm shooting in it. If I'm not, I'm either making a quick pass or I'm getting straight downhill off the bounce. Like there's no catching it. Like pause, look around. What am I doing? Like let the defense get set. Like it's just very decisive, very assertive. That's great stuff. And, you know, selfishly, I want him to shoot more threes. I'd love to get ramp that volume up. But I understand the minutes and I understand that like the offense doesn't run through him. I think what does he have like a 17 percent usage rate? But still the ability to be. Yeah, the, the ability to be efficient on those limited touches is a real big game changer. And I think it changes the complexion of how we feel about this Auburn backcourt because he's. He's really given him something. And then obviously Chad Baker Mazar making all his threes lately too has been helpful. I mean, both of those guys well, well over 40% in SEC play. That plays. Yeah, Baker Mazara, since being put in the starting lineup against Georgia, and he had a season high in that game, he's 45% from three since then. Um, and he's, you know, similar type of player, by the way, just insanely fun player. I mean, there's been lots of fun players on these Bruce Pearl teams. He's He's he, he's he's putting his name down a little bit. I mean, and also just like getting to talk to him last few days in Nashville, like open locker room setting. Um, he's awesome, man. Like he's he's, he's such a fun player. Oh yeah, he's that's 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 my guy. He's he is he is my guy on this team. Um, even though hey, Denver Jones went to my high school, um, so there's we have that connection as well. A couple couple Huntsville guys on this team, but yeah, you mentioned Denver Jones. Like Bruce Pearl has said it. Bruce Pearl doesn't say things accidentally when he plants seeds. He is preparing for Denver Jones to be even a little bit more important next year when he says things like a better coach would get him 14 shots instead of 10, you know, a better coach would get him even more open three pointers. It's like he, he's, he's issuing that, that small sort of subdued challenge to Denver Jones next year. Cause I mean, I think he, you know, he, he's a second team, all SEC type, type guy. If you give him that role. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I think, I mean, I think he's an easy 15 to 18 points a game guy. If he really wanted it on the right team, like, like I'm just thinking like, okay, say you transfer to Arkansas and Arkansas like does their whole thing where they give one guard, like a huge usage rate and says, Hey, you can shoot it as many times as your heart desires. Like he would average a bunch of points on a team like that and credit to him. He, he didn't necessarily go to the place where he's going to get all these amazing gaudy stats he's going to go play his 22 minutes a game he's going to impact winning at a high level he's defending so much better this year than he did last year he's playing more efficient offensively on just a different role and I think it translates better moving forward especially if you think about the NBA like I don't know if he's going to be an NBA guy but I think he wants to make money as a professional whether that's here or overseas what he's doing now at Auburn translates because that's the role you're probably going to have wherever your next step is after post-college yeah, it's funny we go through all this talking about Auburn, too. And, I mean, don't even mention Janai Baroom, who just had an insanely efficient three games as an All-American. But we've uh, – that's – everyone knows. And he's going to be double teams, and he's going to continue to need to pass well out of it. Um, and I just think he's – I think he's one of the best bigs in the tournament. Um, well, well, I guess we can talk a little bit about that because, you know, I don't I don't think we'll get on here again if Auburn is to advance. Let's just, let's just run the hypothetical here. Auburn and UConn in the sweet 16, if that ends up being the case, um, UConn is, and again, insert your own because you're obviously a lot closer to stuff than I am, but like appears to be one of the best regular season basketball teams of the past few years coming off of a national title. Um, it seems like even some players from that, that team last year doing things even better. Um, of course, Klingon and broom, that is, that is just going to be the most appointment television, um, you could possibly ask for. And it's in the garden. So, I mean, I, I you know, it's going to take a, I say it's going to, it would, as we sit here and you know, hypothetical this game, it would take a really, really big performance from Auburn. Um, it would be probably, I think if Auburn were to win this game, and I'm rambling here, I think if Auburn were to beat UConn in the Sweet 16, I think people would wake up the next morning and say, I'm not sure that team's not going to win the national championship. Because I just think it would take that kind of effort where people are going to go, Wow, that team has it all together. And look, it's going to be a long shot, but you look at the way these two teams have played over the last few weeks, it ain't that different. And Auburn matches up pretty well. So I guess just give me your give me your overall thoughts on what that matchup would look like. Are we sure it's a long shot? Like it's, it's yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> going into that game, like 
maybe Auburn's definitely the underdog, hundred percent the underdog by like five points, six points. It's not, it's not this absurd like a twelve point margin here, or like the spread's not UConn minus twelve. Uh, anyway, with my my stuff on UConn, what do they do? Great. The they're different offensively because they just do a ton of sets. Like they, their screens are, and like everything that they do off, off the ball and the cutting, the nonstop movement, it's tough to guard because they do so many things well. Klingon is phenomenal inside, just one of the best rim protect, protectors in college basketball, but they can play differently too. They play him in deep drop coverage um, against ball screens when he's in, and then they bring in Samson Johnson and he's like just six foot 11, fast, bouncy he'll blitz ball screens like he's just very active and mobile so they they can have a little bit of a different punch but there are some holes with this group one i don't know if they have that that killer gear that they had last year like jordan hawkins could come into a game and you know he would first round pick right live for the uh, pelicans and he would go bang 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 and it would be like a four point game that he turns into 14 with like three threes in a row or four threes in a row in just a very quick period of time. I don't know if they could necessarily have that. And the other thing too, athleticism, Auburn can overwhelm you with athleticism and they have the matchup at the four fours have given problems for UConn all year long. Alex Caravan is a shooter. He's a good player. He's a heady player. He is not six foot nine, 245 pound Jalen Williams. And that's the X factor for me moving forward. If Jalen Williams is the best player on the floor in a game against UConn, fours have given them issues literally all year long. Williams has to be awesome that game. And Chaney Johnson, when he gets his minutes, has to be awesome. He gets that little fadeaway, like, like fadeaway jumper from the baseline that he did against Florida. I was like, whoa, where was that? I haven't seen that in a minute. So he, he's got a little bit more offensive bag than I think. And the fours have to be great if you want to beat that, if you want to win that game in that arena. Yeah, I mean, it, it would be I, – I get excited just thinking about the potential of that game that is – we are, we are you know, we're close here to the tip-off of what is going to be an insane four days of basketball that will change everything we think about this tournament. Um, but, again, it's just tough not to – anything can happen, but these are two of the best teams in this, in this field with the way they've played recently, and it's tough not to see them being on a collision course right now. It, it is, and it would be so fun. It'd be so, and I have to remind myself, too, it's like – these are great basketball teams, but they're, we only have 40 guaranteed minutes of basketball left. That's it. There's We only got 40 left. And if yep. you win that, you get another 40. And just got to enjoy it because, you know, Auburn was one of my flag plant, plant teams from the early in the preseason. I picked them high, right? Like, I've just enjoyed watching this team, especially it helps when your bias is get kind of proven right a little bit. And so it's it's like you kind of enjoy those teams. It's like, man, we only have 40 minutes guaranteed left of this. It's like I, I have to even myself. I'm not a fan. Like, I'm a journalist. I'm, I'm locked in on covering college basketball. But I just have to enjoy these moments because we don't have – we don't have 10 more games of this stuff left. It, the end comes really quickly in March, which makes it the best too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we will, we will let you go here. And, and I'm sure again, once again, our listeners have really, really appreciated um, this breakdown, but I feel like I'd be remiss before we go. Um, number one, I will say, I'm going to put all of Isaac's region breakdowns in the description of YouTube podcast where like, if you guys are listening to this, you should be able to find it easily um, because that's going to have everything you want to know, but give me your, uh, Give me your, like you said, I, p- take your pick of which bracket. I, you, you said maybe not your first one. What does your final four look like? Why? And uh, and who do you have winning winning it all in your bracket? Okay, so my final four that I had off my first gut was I went with UConn in the east. I don't feel great about it. In the west, I went with Arizona, another team I just can't give up on, even though that they're like a, they haven't played very well at moments and have some weird losses to bad teams in the South, which is super, super weird because everybody's hurt. Basically every team is hurt. I'm going to go with like the most healthy team for the most part um, in Duke. Cause there's no fives that really give them trouble. You know, I think everybody's kind of selling their shares on Duke, including a lot of Duke fans. And I'm kind of hesitantly, cautiously optimistic that this is a solid draw for them. And then the Midwest again, Kansas complete shell of themselves right now with, with Kevin McCullough out. I think it really opens the door for Tennessee, Creighton, and Purdue. Those feel like the best three teams. I've hemmed and hawed over it. I have no idea who I'm going to pick with that one. I'm probably going to lead lean with Purdue. I just think that there's something different about that team. And if they don't turn it over, they win. They're 25-0 and 0 this year when their turnover rate is under 20% in a single game. So if, if they don't turn the basketball over, it's just really hard to beat those dudes. So those are my four. In the finals, I had Arizona playing Duke. And then I had Arizona winning it all. I was talking to somebody just today that said they had Arizona winning it all. And I said, it's interesting. And they said, yeah, man, there's just been too many flashes 
from this team, even if, even with their ups and downs, and you have that flash. It's like, oh, this team can win a national championship. Like that, they they have the pieces there. Absolutely, and they're they're a little bit built like Auburn, right? A five great guards yeah. that you feel really good about. Multiple bigs. Now they don't have four bigs. They really have three bigs that you like. But those are like the archetypes of teams that I like. The just a lot of different areas that they can beat you, um, and and just being able to play multiple different ways. So. I don't know if I really want to sign up for the Caleb Love roller coaster, but here I am again doing it again, and I'm sure it's going to go real, real great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, then the crazy thing is we get to this, we get to this time, and um, you know, people have their teams that they really like, and like, at least in some of the groups I've been in, like Tennessee, just kind of becomes an afterthought, and it's like it's crazy because look where they were two weeks ago. Um, I'm just not so sure they're not they're not built because you mentioned like the turnover thing with Purdue. Um, Tennessee is capable of, I think that game against Mississippi state is kind of a is mulligan. I mean, I like they're, they're obviously a lot better than that. And it's like connect is going to be probably one of the best players in, in the, in the tournament. And they have an opportunity to play great defense every single night. Um, and so maybe, maybe, maybe he beats the regular season, Rick allegations. I don't know. Absolutely. Well, and I think they got great, great draw too, for the most part is as long the Texas yeah. one is a little bit iffy, right? Texas, is a tough team, really talented. But Creighton, what is their biggest issue? Physicality. And you can question a lot of things about Tennessee, but you cannot question the physicality. So if they both advance to the Sweet 16, I like their draw there. And then, again, like they played Purdue earlier this year. It was a foul fest forever in Maui, and it just was a coin flip game. So you take your shots there. So I wouldn't be stunned at all if Tennessee makes it. It's a That's a really, really talented team, and uh, we'll see. We'll see. It helps, have, it helps have a pro on the floor. It helps have the best player on the floor when uh, when you play in a game. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not a guy that can go get you 40. Like that's not, not too Casual. bad of a thing to have. Um, Isaac Trotter, our national 24 seven basketball writer. Um, you guys can follow him on Twitter at Isaac two underscores Trotter. And like I said, um, I will link all of his region breakdowns. So wherever you're listening to this, um, wanted to get this up on Thursday morning. So I don't know how many of you crazy people are going out to Spokane. Uh, it was quite the excursion today, but if you do um, safe travels, hopefully this gives you some some time to burn on the flight or, I mean, there was somebody on our board who said they were driving from Birmingham. It's 31 hours starting it today. I love it. I, but, love it. I mean, Hey man. And, and like what the stuff people were saying, like this is like Bruce has got it going and he's, he's had it rolling. You never know. You never know what will be the last, what, what, what will be the highest point. You just never know. It's college basketball, man. Like you just never know when it's going to fall off. You never know. This team can get bounced by Yale. This team can go back to the final four. And so, um, shoot, man, if you can, you might as well just try to enjoy the ride because Auburn's not been used to this kind of thing in their history, and, and they're certainly doing it right now. Bites at the apple. Just give yourself a chance every Absolutely. single year, and this is another one of those teams. Wish it was a different draw, but like, hey, let's lace it up. Let's play some basketball. This is, I mean, you've proven you can beat anybody in the country. Now go prove it. Yeah, and I mean, they, they, they probably aren't glad to do it again, but like they made a historic run in 19 to beat Kansas, North Carolina, and Kentucky. I mean, everyone looked at that draw, and they're like, oh, Auburn, the five seed? Yeah, no shot they're coming out of that one. And so you never know what will happen, and, I, and I, I'm i interested to see what happens with this team. Bruce Pearl said, you know, somebody asked him, is this a great team in, in your eyes? Because he said, you know, well, we have the potential to be good. Can we be great? And he was like, yeah, they're great. Like, he he basically said everything from here, not, not that it's gravy, but he was like, everything from here is an opportunity. But he was like, I've seen enough. This team has proven it to me all year long. They are a great team. In my eyes, I'm interested to see if this is the best basketball team he's had at Auburn. I'm not sure it isn't already. For it, it, are they going to win the most games? Maybe not. Are they going to? You know, it's like there's different parameters to sort of to sort of uh, describe that label. But I am interested here. And if they get to UConn and be UConn in the Sweet 16, it'll be it'll be tough to argue against it. Um, and so should be a really great tournament. Um, I, again, go follow Isaac on Twitter. I'm really looking forward to. Uh, not only watching these games, but uh, the reaction from people every single game is also going to be a lot of fun as well. So uh, we'll let Isaac get out of here. Thank you guys so much for listening. Five-star review if you guys enjoyed the show. Um, the Well, there won't be bumper music because I'm not at my home uh, setup. So you will not get any bumper music. You'll go straight to ads. So we appreciate everybody for uh, for listening. Um, go head over to auburnundercover.com, and we will talk to you guys soon.